Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to help keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive method of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. Subjects range from dog behavior, stress-free training, and other tools to help you understand your relationship with your dog. If you like the webinar, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Click the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be notified when future videos are posted. Now enjoy the webinar. Hello everyone. Today's webinar is about the controversy over dominance in pet training. Since so many trainers and pet parents still use this concept with their pets, it seems like a particularly useful topic to discuss. Whether you are unfamiliar with the controversy or want to use the information you learn here to help educate other pet parents. But first, let me introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Megan Ropsky. Following graduation from the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine, Dr. Ropsky completed a rotating internship at Friendship Hospital for Animals in Washington, D.C., where she continued to work in the emergency surgery department. However, after completing the fear-free elite certification, Dr. Ropsky decided that her real interest was in helping pets overcome their behavior challenges. She did a clinical behavior residency with Dr. Amy Pike at the Animal Behavior Wellness Center and then returned to Friendship this fall to start a behavior service. Please put your questions in the chat. We will get to as many as possible at the end. You may not realize that Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit and that our free services, including these webinars, rely on donations. So please consider donating. Go to the homepage on our website and you'll see a donations icon in the upper right corner. We appreciate your support. I know that we will all learn a lot today. It's all yours, Dr. Robsky. Thank you so much for that introduction. I appreciate all of you being here watching live or watching at a later time. Let's get started. So really, where do we start? My goal was to take a look at dominance from first an owner's perspective. So if someone were to use their preferred search engine of choice, what information would they find and how could that information be used? And then I wanted to compile information from a veterinarian who specializes in behaviors perspective, looking more at literature, adding in some more studies, and then melding that information together to provide some additional information on training, body language, and even the human-animal bond. When we think about where can we get started, think about a typical Saturday night. Dinner is finished, dishes are cleaned, and a family sits down to watch TV. The image you have on your screen is of a family of four sitting on a couch, and a handsome golden retriever is staring into the camera. It's not uncommon for us to see food commercials comparing dogs to wolves. Commercials that make us think about what we should be feeding our dogs, how we are feeding them, but also fostering that connection between these two very distinct species. So the image you have on your screen is three pairs of dogs and wolves in similar situations. What might we take from these commercials? My dog is like a wolf. Wolves hunt and eat meat. If my dog is like a wolf, then they should eat meat too. And that might also bridge us to dogs behave like wolves. Well, that makes me think, well, if this looks like a wolf, so we've got an image of a wolf looking into our, our camera here. Well, this husky looking dog also looks like a wolf. This is an actual husky that looks kind of like a wolf. But then we get to a golden retriever, an American bulldog, and a Chinese crested. So the challenge that I find is, though we might have descended from wolves, these species of dogs and these breeds are very different, and they have different social structures. They have slightly different needs. Certainly the Chinese crested isn't going to be out in, say, three feet of snow hunting its own food. The other thing that I think of is there are lots of memes out and about. So the uh, memes that we see most commonly, we can certainly see that the, the memes we have here, the two different ones that we have on the top side is a wolf walking through the snow and it says, maybe I can find something to eat at this campfire. What's the worst that might happen? 
Then below it, it says 10,000 years later, what happens? We've got dogs with sunglasses, with little blankets wrapped around them. And then we've got two adorable dachshunds with little snoods on their heads with little ears. So the thing that I think about a lot is dogs might have descended from wolves. We certainly know that. But the big question is, though they might have descended from wolves, we certainly have dogs that are very different than the wolves that we had 10,000 years ago. Next up, we think about taming versus domestication. So taming is not domestication. Taming refers to a learned behavior of an individual at one point in time that was not passed down from generation to generation. Domestication refers to a suite of heritable behaviors that are adapted to the human environment in a population of animals. So that means that is something that can be passed down from generation to generation. We as humans can select various traits that helps dogs to work better with us. And through that selection is how we get the modern dogs that we come to know today. When we think about dogs versus wolves, sure, can we get an idea of what behaviors to study in dogs from wolves? Yes, but dogs diverged from wolves about 15,000 years ago. That's a big time gap. There's a lot of differences between wolves and dogs that we know today. Dogs evolved as scavengers and the least fearful of the group were the ones that were domesticated, that humans were able to bring into their community and mold in future generations to what they needed to be successful. Wolves evolved as hunters and they were not domesticated. So dogs in the wild are typically small in unrelated groups and they may be more likely to spend time alone. The differences we have in these social systems lead to differences in social behavior between these two different types of animals. I did want to provide us with a few wolf fun facts. So typically when we think of wolves, we are thinking of gray wolves that are native to North America. Some of the largest members of the dog family are wolves and the pack is called, the family group is called a pack. It consists of about six to 10 individuals. There's a primary mating male and female, and then there are also those mating pairs offspring, most likely consisting of females. There may be some males within the group, but typically only the primary pair mates and the others help to raise litters and hunt for food. They're typically monogamous, so one pair is breeding, but about 25% of packs might have multiple breeding units. They can travel upwards of 12 miles a day, and this image here showing this wolf howling is to remind us that each howl is unique to that wolf, so they almost have their own individual signature. When we think about wolf behavior, wolf Wolves are territorial in that they are willing to fight invading groups or invading individuals to protect themselves and their resources. Wolves might show threatening body postures without overt escalation to aggression to diffuse a tense situation, to diminish the risk of confrontation. So the image we have here on the slide is two wolves. We're certainly seeing posturing from the one wolf that is snarling and we're seeing a second wolf that says, I am not a threat. We're seeing its lips kind of pull back. We're seeing its tongue out. That second wolf is saying, I'm not a threat. I don't want this to escalate. When we think about wolves that we might be sort of thinking of, wolves that we might know, we might be thinking of Yellowstone National Park. So the image we have here is of the Druid pack. We're seeing about 10-ish wolves in a snowy scene, and this is the actual Druid peak pack. These are original wolves that were captured in Canada and introduced into Yellowstone National Park in the mid-1990s. This is the most well-known wolf pack purely because of their high visibility to guests of the park. It also became the largest pack at 37 wolves. 
They were the dominant pack in the park for 14 years, meaning that they were the ones that fended off the majority of the other small packs around them. This pack actually dissolved um, a couple of years, well, I should say 10 to 12 years after they were introduced into the park because the breeding female was killed by her sister. That sister ended up passing away and the breeding male could not breed with any of the other females in the pack because they were his offspring. So another male came in and started to breed. So very different social structure than we have from the dogs that we might be thinking of today that we share our homes with. So where did this idea of dominance appear in the literature? The first chattings of it, the first reportings we have of it is from Rudolf Schnakel. He was a Swiss animal behaviorist studying captive wolves in a zoo setting in the 1930s and 1940s. He concluded that wolves fight to gain dominance and the quote unquote winner is the alpha. This conclusion was extrapolated from captive wolves to wild wolves and then to domestic dogs. These animals have completely different environments, completely different social structures, and completely different learning experiences. So the challenge we find ourselves in is, after Schnickel made these observations, other scientists also observed captive wolves and came to the same conclusions. These unrelated wolves that are forced to live together will engage in aggression. Fast forward to David Meech, a prominent wolf researcher, publishing, quote, The Wolf, Ecology and Behavior of an Endangered Species. This came out in 1968. This again discussed the alpha wolf theory, reiterated the theory, put it into press in a book. Dr. Meech has since refuted this information and has asked the publisher to stop publishing the outdated information. So how does this wolf theory translate to dog training? This theory was applied to dogs and training via dominance, punishment, and aversive techniques. Examples include training dogs in the military in the world wars, the quote alpha role technique and physical punishments that were made popular in the 1970s and 1980s, and unfortunately, various current television personalities that, that advocate for the alpha theory in dog training. If we think about dog training being based on these pack dynamics, remember this came about 20 plus years ago. Traditional dog training started with punishment based techniques. The idea was that owners needed to be the pack leader and to show their dog who was dominant and who was the boss. The problem here is that punishment-based techniques seem like a good idea. A dog performed an inappropriate behavior, they were punished, they were expected to not do it again. If they did, they would get punished again. But we have to think, who is that behavior inappropriate to? The human. If we are expecting a dog to understand that the behavior that we don't want or that is inappropriate should not be done again, we are asking them to completely understand our human culture. We're asking them to understand all of these different situations that they are just not privy to. The image we have here is of a husky and a red dog. The husky is standing over this red dog. This red dog is showing its belly. This image is similar to this one that is of three wolves in a similar situation. Again, think of those differences that we're seeing between these two types of animals. When I think about what could a owner be looking at when they do a image search or a video search of dominance in dogs. So I did this search about a year or so ago now. And what we see is titles of videos such as dog dominance attack gives us a huge scare. Then we've got a dominant dog is not a cuddly dog. And then we have alpha dog dominance in dogs. All of these are challenging videos because you might be likely to click on them. There's a fair number of views, certainly might be, might I be tempted to engage with that video. 
These are also all keying into a dog's relationship with a human, but in certain situations. We also see differences as far as dog play and posturing to avoid conflict and dog play again. So even here, one might search this dominance in dogs topic, but what do we do with that information? If we go to a search of websites, again, this is a brief snippet of dominance in dogs. I used Google to search this. And the biggest takeaway that I would say is, yes, it gives you information, but is that information safe and appropriate for you and your dog? My worry is we have things that say there's a specific need for being a strong alpha in their owner. We see that aggressive behaviors among dogs is usually the result of lack of leadership. Well, those two sentences make me think, gosh, if my dog does things that I don't like, does that mean that I'm being a bad leader? Do I need to do something different to almost get their attention? Ugh, I don't know how that makes you guys feel, but I know that makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. There are some good options when we look at this search. So the challenge is these good options, these options that might provide more scientific views, more views that don't use these potentially punishment based techniques are intermixed with those that do. So how do we know how to find those options? So we've already talked about this a little bit already, but we certainly see the reemergence of dominance theory, traditional animal training, relying on dominance theory. The assumption is made that animals are misbehaving because they are trying to attain a higher rank in our household. Think about those pack dynamics. This leads owners and trainers to believe that force or coercion must be used to modify these behaviors. That's where we get this term being the alpha. The challenge is it's teaching owners that the only way to live in harmony with their dog is to have control over them and be the boss. Ugh, this creates an adversarial relationship between the human and the dog. It's based on the thinking that the dog wants control of the home, the owner's life, and it causes damage to the human animal bond and can lead to fear, anxiety, and aggression. The images we see on the next slide are examples of what this dominance-based theory in training is teaching folks to do. So the first image we'll look at is in the upper right. So to give you all a description, this image is of a man in a blue shirt who is actually physically sitting on a lab type dog. This man is holding this dog down by his head and neck, and this dog is physically unable to move. The image on the left is of a woman doing something similar to a terrier type dog, but she is holding this dog's head and neck to the floor. Both of these are examples of what was termed the alpha role. The idea is I, as the human, roll this dog onto its back and hold it down until it submits. This is to show the dog who is the quote unquote alpha. I don't know about you, but that makes me a bit uncomfortable. The image on the lower right hand side of the screen is of a single hand holding down a black and white small terrier type dog and two fingers are pressed against that dog's throat and its tongue is out. That seems to be a bit of an uncomfortable situation for that dog. And if I were that dog, I would be a little bit afraid to interact with that human. The next image that we have is a still image taken from a television show. I'm not going to name the show here. You are easily able to find that on your own. But the image we have here is of a man scruffing two terrier type dogs, and he's actually holding them up off of the couch. So this is an example of scruffing, which is, again, another technique that is used to, quote unquote, show these dogs who is boss. The challenging situation that we get into is aggression leads to more aggression. Aggressive actions cause fear and aggression in our dogs. When we act with aggression, we are showing our dog that the only way to protect itself is to escalate the situation, 
using teeth or claws to get away or to stop that interaction with us. Aggressive displays lead to the fight or flight response. So in those previous examples, if we are pinning a dog down or scruffing them, they cannot flee. Their only option is to effectively fight. When we act with aggression, we are only teaching our dogs that we are dangerous creatures to be avoided or fought off. All behavior serves a function. We might think that a behavior is inappropriate, but do the dogs living with us understand that? Likely not, especially if they don't have previous learning experiences to do so. The good news is we have alternative options. We can focus on being a caring in a caring and productive relationship, one that is consistent and predictable for any animal or being in our household. Guidance and motivation on our part helps them to understand what we expect in various situations. It also allows us to reach for positive reinforcement to let our dogs know what we like when they're doing or what we would like to see more of. That behavior is exactly what we should do in that situation. I'd love to see more of that. That's a completely different relationship than what we had thought of previously. What's great for us is we have a fair number of resources on our side to provide us with that information. The American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior actually has a position statement on the use of dominance theory in behavior modification of animals. It's available as a PDF online, and it says that dominance theory should not be used, to put it bluntly. The Association of Professional Dog Trainers also has a position statement on dominance. They talk a bit about where this theory comes from, what we've already covered a bit on pack dynamics and wolves, and they actually quote David Meech saying that in 2008, he said we should quote, end the outmoded view of the wolf pack as an aggressive assortment of wolves consistently competing with each other to take over the pack. So this is a wolf researcher who is saying that what we learned from captive wolves is incorrect when we look at actual family pack dynamics. While dogs are similar to wolves, they differ in many ways. They also state that Dominance is a descriptive term of a relationship between individuals. Therefore, a dog on its own cannot be described as dominant. When we think of dominance in a relationship, this is where we are deciding who has access to the first pick of available resources. So think about food, bedding, or toys. This image that we have here is of a canid type animal. It says it's a wolf. It could be a coyote, hard to say, but it has a food resource. It has a piece of meat that it is eating. These relationships might not be the same for every situation. Most often this is resolved without conflict. So it's resolved in a peaceable fashion. So why might some of these interactions result in aggression? Aggression is a behavior in which an animal, human, dog, insert your animal here, feels as though its resources are threatened. It uses aggression to increase distance and it will escalate in the interaction if its subtle signs are not heard. Any being is capable of aggression, even you, even me. So let's think about a couple of situations. So these two images I have next are examples, but interesting to think of. This first one shows a seagull poking its head into the screen, and it says, when you hear a coworker say there are donuts in the break room, I don't know about you, but I'm running to that break room. This next one shows us a very similar idea. There are donuts in the break room, and it's a little hamster or gerbil running towards the break room. Now, I certainly wouldn't bump anyone, meaning to on the way to the break room. But if I hadn't had breakfast that morning, you bet I am running to that break room as fast as I possibly can. Not necessarily a situation where I would show aggression, but think of a similar situation where say, if a human being was starving and there were donuts in the break room, they might be a little bit more pressed to get to that break room than I am on a daily basis. 
Think about any being being capable of showing aggression. Our understanding of dominance theory and the behavior of domestic animals has led to updated views. When we think about it, are most of us trying to gain or assert dominance? Oh, most of us aren't. We are trying to modify our dog, our pet's behavior. What could that be? Barking over exuberant greetings, jumping, nipping, poor recall. These behaviors likely continue because they are inadvertently rewarded or because alternative behaviors have not been trained. We aren't looking for dominance. We are looking to be able to influence our pet's behaviors more willingly. Why is applying dominance theory concerning? It causes people to resort to punishment. Aggression's underlying motivation is commonly fear and anxiety. Punishment worsens fear and anxiety and therefore aggression. In the wild, dominance-based relationships are truly based on ritualistic displays. When people resort to threatening with aggressive displays or even physical force, that animal can react out of aggression that's due to fear. Punishment may suppress the underlying behavior, but it doesn't do so without addressing the cause. Using dominance theory leads to antagonistic relationships between owners and their pets. So the two images we have here, one is of a German Shepherd type dog with his or her mouth around the hand of a human. The other is of a hound type dog laying with their human and sleeping. The AVSAB standard of care states that behaviorists should not use dominance as a guide for behavior modification. Behaviorists should use behavior modification and training that focuses on reinforcing desirable behaviors, avoiding the reinforcement of undesirable behaviors, and to strive to understand the underlying emotional state. I get a little bit hung up on the terms leadership versus dominance. When you search a definition of leadership, I found one that says leadership is defined as the process of influencing the activities of an individual or a group to achieve a certain objective. In that definition, it says nothing about force, submission, aggression, coercion, anything like that. But coercion and force can generate passive resistance, and it requires continuous pressure from the leader. Ugh, I worry we might have misconstrued the term leader to imply a dominant individual. So how can we be leaders in the truest sense of the word? Truthfully, through positive reinforcement. Can we reward appropriate behaviors? Can we ignore or at least work to not reward those inappropriate behaviors that we as the humans deem inappropriate? And can we provide consistency and effective communication? This quote attributed to Jay Allen states, a great leader knows how to motivate others. Motivation does not consist of down talk, belittling and anger. Good leadership is compassionate, understanding and being an outstanding example. So I think about, is there a term that we could use instead of leader, partner, friend, guide, ally, companion, teammate, any of these terms provide a very different connotation than pack leader. So we have the emergence of positive reinforcement and training. In the 1980s, Karen Pryor wrote the book, Don't Shoot the Dog. I have it on my shelf next to me. This book was intended to help humans understand their dog's behavior and provide a training style not rooted in dominance and punishment. Various animal organizations have been formed to promote training in a rewards-based fashion. The terms force-free training and least intrusive, minimally aversive, or LIMA, began to be used in popular culture. We also have the fear-free certification becoming available for veterinarians, trainers, groomers, and other pet professionals. Remember, this happened in the 1980s, right after and during that dominance theory emerging. We were looking for another way to strengthen that bond between us and the pets under our care. 
let's look at a couple of journal articles. I've only picked two so that we don't go into information overload. This first one is entitled Dominance in Dogs, a Useful Construct or Bad Habit. So this article is from the Journal of Veterinary Behavior in 2009. It talks about dominance being a concept of relationships and not being applied to individual dogs. Dominance is misapplied as a motivation for social interaction. A common suggestion is that the desire to be dominant is a driver of behavior and aggression in the domestic dog. They cite recent wolf studies question the direct connection between dominance and agonistic behavior or aggression. They are talking about studies done on wolves out in the wild, so not those done on captive wolves. They also discuss fearful dogs or feral dog studies, sorry, showing that behavior of these animals differs from wolves. We then have a more recent article from 2014 that's actually a response to a response from that previous article. So this is one from 2016. It is again saying that dominance is not a character trait, but a property of relationships. Wolf behavior does not have much utility on interpreting domestic dog behavior. I'm gonna say it again. Wolf behavior does not have much utility in interpreting domestic dog behavior. So let's question, why do they misbehave? They might misbehave because of confusion, distractions, lack of training, lack of motivation, lack of understanding what we as the humans are asking, the stage of development that they're in, or even underlying anxiety, fear, or stress. The image we have here is of a Great Dane on a completely destroyed couch. What is the answer to misbehavior? Well, the key to good behavior is predictability, consistency, and providing appropriate reinforcement. The quote we have here states, what you do every day matters more than what you do once in a while. While we're on the topic of myths associated with veterinary behavior, let's key into a couple of more that are related to dominance theory, but also are related to learning in general. Good gracious, they bit out of nowhere. Those bites might seem out of nowhere because we may not be noticing the body language leading up to those bites. Often, animals are indicating their discomfort with the situation well before that bite occurred. The image we have here is from Dr. Sophia Yin. It is a infographic on the body language of fear in dogs. It keys into some of the more subtle signs of fear in dogs that we might not be picking up quite easily. So things like licking of the lips, panting, a furrowed brow. They might be acting sleepy or yawning when they shouldn't be. Maybe they are hypervigilant, being really worried about what's happening in the environment around them. Maybe they're moving away, maybe they're pacing. Those are all subtle signs that show us that these dogs are uncomfortable with the situation. I do want to give us a little bit more information on that specific example. So I do have two videos that I would like to show all of you that are showing videos of aggression in two dogs that result in bites to humans. There will not be any sound on these videos, but if this could be a trigger for you, I would advise you to turn away and I will let you know when these images are no longer present. I'm going to come out of the presentation to pull these images up, so bear with me for just a moment.
Okay, those images are off of the screen now. You are free to turn back around. I think the one thing that I would like for everyone to take from those videos are seeing all of those signs that happened before those bites or even the inhibited bites that we saw in the second video. Those dogs were broadcasting well before those bites that they were uncomfortable with the situation. And the challenge was the humans involved did not even notice. The image we have here on the screen is the ladder of aggression. So it is showing us that there are very many signs before we get to a growl, snap, or a bite that dogs may show us that we as the humans in charge of their care should be mindful of. In what situations could there be no warning signals? If there's a short distance between the stimulus and the dog, meaning the stimulus moves in too quickly and the dog doesn't have time to give us those warning signals. If the stimulus is very intense and the dog perceives the need for a bigger, larger reaction to ward off that threat. We also have to be mindful that dogs move faster than we do. So if we are slow to pick up on their uncomfortability, we might miss those warning signs. The other challenge is keying back to dominance theory. Dogs that have received punishment for previous warning signs very much so learn that the turn of a head, the squinting of the eyes, the blinking of the eyes, maybe I'm licking my lips, are all not okay. A great example is if a dog is punished for a growl, they will easily learn that a growl is not acceptable and they shouldn't do it in the future. But the challenge is that leads to an escalation and an aggression. So you lose the subtle signs that I'm uncomfortable and I resort to a snap and a bite quickly. Another myth that I hear often is my dog can't learn that. Folks will describe their dogs as my dog is dumb, stubborn, not listening, being difficult. Dogs that appear to have difficulty are likely either too stressed or too anxious to learn. They don't understand what's being asked of them or we as the humans are moving too quickly. We're asking them for a high school level behavior when maybe they're only in pre-K. We're certainly not asking our kindergartners to do calculus and we shouldn't ask that of our dogs either. A uh, key thing that I like to think of is our dogs aren't giving us a hard time, they're having a hard time. And having that mindset helps us to be better teachers for them. Remember that animals are learning with every interaction and situation that they are put in. Associations are based on the learner. It really depends on what that dog is learning in that situation. If our goal is to increase a behavior, well then reward it. If our goal is to decrease a behavior, well ignore that behavior and reinforce a different one. That leads us into a small slide about training and picking a trainer. So I get a lot of questions about, well, can't just any trainer help me? Potentially, but I would be wary about a couple of things. I would make sure that a trainer does not use punishment, aversives, corrections, or compulsion. That can be balanced training. That could be choke collars, prong collars, electronic collars, penny cans, spray bottles, letting them cry it out, all of these things. If I see that on a, a trainer's website or business information, that makes me worried that they're clearly comfortable using these more punishment aversive based techniques. When we think about that balanced side of training, those are my trainers who are comfortable using positive reinforcement, but also trainers that are comfortable using these other methods. And it makes me wary about saying yes to working with that dog and that trainer. It makes me worried about what techniques are potentially being used because I don't recommend using punishment or aversives when I'm working with a trainer in my profession. I would also research their certifications. Good gosh, do they have any? There are definitely certifying training bodies that are out there that are producing positive reinforcement based trainers. Those are the ones that I would be looking for. 
I would also recommend getting a recommendation, hearing what other people have to say, hearing what techniques people report that they are using, not solely basing it off of the images on the website, but hearing from other people what techniques are actually being used. And the biggest thing that I think of is we cannot guarantee behavior. We can work to decrease risk and manage the environment, but we cannot, without a doubt, guarantee a behavior will be fixed, cured, will never happen again. If you see that, ugh, that might be a red flag for me. The one thing that I want to leave y'all with at the end of this presentation is you should feel comfortable and your dog should feel comfortable, whether that be with a veterinary professional, with a training professional, with the relationship that you have with your dog in your home, everyone should be comfortable. And if something happens that makes you feel uncomfortable while working with a professional, speak up and be an advocate for your dog. I do want to leave y'all with one slide as a thank you. So these are my pets that are the reason why I got into veterinary behavior. The gorgeous lab mix laying on the ground is Sadie. She just turned eight in September. And the handsome gray and white cat is Killian. He just turned 13 in September. They both have their own individual behavior concerns and we are working through them. We are all a work in progress. They are just as much as I am. I do wanna leave this slide up for a moment because it does have my contact information on it. So I'm part of the Friendship Behavior Specialists. That's the service that we started this year in 2022. It is at the Friendship Hospital for Animals in Washington, DC. Should you be interested in contacting us, email is best. So that's behavior at friendshiphospital.com. You're also welcome to follow us on Instagram. It is at Friendship Behavior Specialists, all one word, all lowercase. That's the best way to get a hold of us. And I would say I'm happy to take questions as y'all have them and I'll end the show so we can be a little bit more interactive. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowski. Um, it looks like we have some good questions. Awesome. The first one, my dog's Embark DNA report said her quote wolfiness score was 1.7%. What does this mean? Hmm. Honestly, that is a great question and I've never been asked it before. I would guess, and this is really just a guess, I'm not a geneticist, so I would guess that there are potentially genes that they are tracking back either further than, say, a domestic dog breed or ones that they might have connections to other genomes or sort of genetic compilations that we have. Honestly, I would say that's a great question for the Embark folks to say, hey, where did y'all get this information from? Just because not being a geneticist myself, that's really my best guess. I hope that's helpful. Great. The next question is, can taming slash learned behaviors lead to domestication or do animals that can be tamed already have genetic traits that are amenable to domestication? That's a great question. Honestly, I would say the latter. So I would think about the idea of the dogs way back when that were more likely to be domesticated probably had traits that they were already showing that the humans of the time said, huh, well, that dog is less fearful of us. That dog just took food from my hand. Can we bring them into the fold, if you will, into the community? And then those dogs, because of those characteristics, were then bred to each other to produce future dogs that then had those similar characteristics because we really need those characteristics to be inherited to be able to be passed down generation to generation the next question is what about the dynamics between dogs in multiple dog households 
Honestly, that is a great question. And that's where I would think about that relationship. So could there be some vying for resources there? Definitely. I can see that for sure. Very different than the human dog relationship. But I would also think about those relationships in a multi-dog household. You probably don't have a dog that is truly dominant in every single situation. There's probably situations where one dog seems to care a bit more about this resource, say the food bowl, the bed, the couch, and another dog might care more about human attention, who gets snuggled first before you know anybody else. So I can see situations where can those relationships of vying for greater access to resources come out? Yes but it's in that one specific relationship. Um, going back to the Embark question, thank you. Someone put in the chat um, a quote, I'm thinking from the Embark website. So it looks mm -hmm. like there's more info to be found with Embark um, as Dr. Rofsky suggested. Fair. Um, someone has asked, were you saying that wolves don't, I'm sorry, hold on one second. <laughs> That's why mine are outside the door and my husband is watching them. So I totally get it. <laughs> Sorry, it was UPS delivery time. <laughs> of course it was. Of course it was. Good gracious. <laughs> um, someone had a question about the wolf pack, the druid pack, yeah. and how they broke up. And they're asking about um, dogs sharing traits associated with that pack. Um, I think they're looking for more explanation about what happened with that pack when they broke up. Yeah, so really the, at least what the researchers have have shown, most of these wolves actually had radio collars on, so we're able to basically track where they are going. And in Yellowstone, there are a fair number of researchers that quite literally watch these wolves as much as they possibly can to see what they were doing. So at least with this specific pack, what they're reporting was there was an initial pair of a breeding male and female. This female died. I think she was killed if I remember correctly. And her sister became the breeding female because at least this male and this sister were not related. The challenge was she then died off. He was left but everyone else in his pack was directly related to him. So at least in that, who can I breed with? Who can I not breed with? I certainly don't want to breed with someone that is directly my offspring. So he basically left the pack to let somebody else come in to be able to breed because he wasn't able to produce any more offspring without some pretty substantial inbreeding. I hope that gives you a little bit more detail. It's certainly interesting dynamics that we see. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, the next question, how do you teach the dog to leave something alone without a no, other than calling them away if you cannot always be with them to call them away? How do they learn to leave something alone? Honestly, that's a great question. And I think it's one where my brain thinks of how do I set that dog up for success in the environment? So that would be a, a form of environmental modification. I would think of the classic example that I get questions about all of the time are say, my poor little counter surfers. So the idea that at one point, something delicious was on the counter, my dog pops up onto the counter and says, hmm, I'll take that off of the counter. It's happened in my household. I totally get it. What I would say is in that situation, do I do a bit of a better job to make sure there's nothing on the counter that could be scavenged? Do I also do potentially a better job of saying, okay, my dog doesn't go into the kitchen when I am not present. So I'm eliminating that opportunity to scavenge off of the counter when I'm not there. And when I am present, say I'm cooking in the kitchen, I'm mindful of what's happening on the counters around me. Do I reinforce a different incompatible behavior? So I think about what is incompatible with hopping up onto the counter, snagging something off of the counter sitting on a mat over on the side of my kitchen that I can toss treats to. My dog is on that mat. Good job. That's exactly where I want you to be. Can I toss treats instead? So if my butt is on a mat, 
I can't be hopping up on the counter to eat something that I'm not supposed to. That simple environmental modification can be applied to so many different things. Can it be I shut the bathroom door so my dog doesn't get into the garbage? Can it be I get a laundry hamper with a lid so that they don't pull dirty clothes out of the hamper? Can that be a, and this happens in my household, can that be a, I get a gate in front of the bathroom with the cat litter box in it so that the dog doesn't eat the poop from the litter box? Certainly. So that's where I think of if I modify the environment to decrease the likelihood of the behavior, I'm already one step ahead. And then can I reinforce a different behavior? So that's where I at least get a, a bit away from using that no, if I'm setting them up for success from the beginning. I hope that helps. Awesome. Um, okay, here's a cool question. Yeah. If I'm not very social, can this affect my dog? Hmm. You know, that is a great question. And there's a part of me that almost wonders if we truly do have the answer to that question right now with the current science that we have. I can't necessarily think of a journal article that speaks to that specifically. I can think of situations where, say, can a dog pick up on our emotions in a certain situation, I would say it's likely possible. I guess I would be hard pressed to say if I know for sure, decrease in say human sociability leads to a decrease in dog sociability, if that makes sense. I think I would say, I just don't know if we have enough data to answer that question just yet. Someone has asked, I had a foster dog who was fear aggressive. What are some good ways to help dogs like that trust people again? Oh, that is a great question. And I will say it's a pretty common diagnosis that I use in my behavior practice. So not uncommon to see that fear cause that aggression. Think about what aggression is. It's a distance increasing behavior. I want that trigger, that stimulus to get as far away from me as possible so that I can be comfortable. In those situations, honestly, I think about how do I first avoid triggers as much as I possibly can and especially when I cannot control that situation. So I don't want those dogs to experience triggers willy nilly. And I also don't want them to experience triggers or stimulus with such an intensity that that fear-based aggression comes out, that that dog feels the need to react. So what could that look like? Could that look like having a controlled situation? You've set up the environment for success. You know what that trigger is. And you have, say, it's a person. You have that person at a far enough distance that your dog does not react. And then can you use positive reinforcement? So can I bring out a cookie when that reaction is not happening? Here's that cookie. The biggest thing that I find with my dogs that are fearful is that trigger needs to be far enough away for them to be interested in that food item of choice. So sometimes that can be challenging to figure out what that distance is to then create that positive association between that trigger, that stimulus, and that food reinforcer. That's honestly the biggest thing that I can think of as far as general information to help those more fearful dogs be successful. I will also think of it is a pretty slow process. So this is not a, oh great, we did one training session and my dog's gonna be able to go to a winery or a brewery or an outside patio dinner tomorrow it's definitely going to be a slow and steady wins the race type of a process. But my big ticket item is decreasing exposure unless we are doing it in a controlled setting where that dog and you can be successful and keeping those stimulus that trigger as far away as needed to keep that dog under the threshold of having a reaction before moving it closer or making it more intense. And that's honestly in a situation where I would grab a positive reinforcement trainer to help me be more successful so that you're not going it alone. That's a really great option for a trainer to help. 
Great. I also um, just put a link in the chat. Uh, Dr. Robsky actually did another awesome webinar for us called When Your Dog is Reactive to People. That might have some tips there as well, but um, feel free to reach out to us for um, help getting something set up with a private trainer or seeing Dr. Uh, Robsky for a consult as well. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. Here's a, an interesting question. Creating yeah. theory is somewhat based on, I'm sorry, I just jumped down, wolf dens. Is that correct? Do changes in our understanding of wolves affect behaviorists' attitudes about crating? <sighs> Honestly, I think crating is a topic that we are, you know, we're exploring a lot more frequently now. We are almost delving into what does crating actually provide for a dog? And honestly, I would think of just as we humans are each individuals and have different preferences, I would be wary of, say, a general crating theory of every dog should be able to be crated, be comfortable in a crate. The ones that I think of in particular, say, are separation anxiety dogs, my own in particular. There are a fair number that are uncomfortable with crating. So even though, say, crating being tied to a wolf den, a comfortable space, this is some place that you should feel the safest in the world, there are some dogs that crating is just not a safe space for them. So I would say, I think as we are starting to learn a bit more, though we might have made the association initially, might there be differences that we are seeing in comfortability with crating these dogs are living in a home they're very different than a wolf environment i think there are things that we are starting to know and learn more and i would also think of each dog as an individual and can i apply every theory to every single dog sometimes that's hard to do great Okay, yeah. here's a general question that um, I have a feeling we might point you towards some other webinars that dive deeper into anxiety. But this question is, what causes anxiety in dogs? How would I know that my dog has anxiety? Oh, good gracious. And yeah, I was going to say, Nicole, I bet you, you all have a ton of resources either within your dog's friend or branching out into other spaces for that. So when I think about in general, what causes anxiety? The things that I think of are genetics. So are my genetics predisposing me to be anxious? Do I also think of environment? So we already talked a bit about that with the uh, dog getting up on the counter question. Are there certain environments that could potentially predispose a dog to being anxious, be more anxious in certain situations? Definitely. I also think about previous learning experiences. So whether that is during their early socialization period, that critical window that we think from at least leading up to about 12 to 14, 16 weeks, anything that we either experience there or don't experience but experience in a potentially positive or negative light can certainly lead to having those potentially anxious feelings in the future. So those are at least the big things that I think of what might lead to anxiety. Certainly we can think of things like a traumatic experience, say, God forbid, your dog is in a, a, a car when you get in a car accident. Might they be a bit more afraid of cars in the future? It's possible. So I think of that. I also think of what previous training techniques were used. Can we certainly see that dogs that have had either punishment or aversive based techniques been used in the past can be a bit more anxious, a bit more fearful? I certainly see it in my practice. And when I think of what might anxiety look like, that infographic from um, Dr. Dr. Sophia Yin that I showed, great example of fear, but also a good example of some signs of anxiety. So I think of when my dog maybe looks a bit uncomfortable in a situation. So what are they doing with their eyes? Are they averting their gaze? Are they looking away? Do their ears maybe look a little bit pinned? Do we see a little bit more of a furrowed brow? Might I see some lip licking? Might I also see a dog that just sits 
and does absolutely nothing. So freezes in their environment and almost looks like if I could just dissolve into this wall, might that be better for me because I'm so uncomfortable. Other physical signs we can see shaking, tremoring, tail tucking, running away, trying to get out of that situation. There are certainly a fair number of signs that we can see. And I would say it's it would take a fair amount to go through all of them. And I would hazard a guess to say, Nicole, I'm sure we can point folks in the right direction for other webinars that y'all have on those specific signs. Yeah, Deborah, I wonder if in the follow up email, we could include a couple links to the webinars that are specifically about stress and anxiety. Um, and anyone, if you would like to send an email to your dog's friend information at gmail.com, I would be happy to send you direct links that way also. Awesome. Um, next question is, I understand the point of environmental modifications but I still can't completely understand why we wouldn't also want to train the dog to listen to cues to, for example, stay off or leave it. Are you against using those cues? Mm, great question. I would say certainly not against using those cues as long as the dog knows that cue ahead of time. So that's a situation where if I am going to train an off cue, my girl has one, certainly, I use it for, can you please get off the couch? Can you please get off the bed or you know, get off of a certain piece of furniture? I have trained that outside of the situation that I needed. So I would say I would certainly be setting someone up for failure if, say, uh, a dog was, we don't want that dog on the bed. If they're already on the bed and they don't know that off cue, well, that's certainly that off cue or even a leave it cue is not going to be successful in a situation that they don't already know it. And I would also say in that situation, say I'm using off, I'm asking the dog for a behavior that I'm expecting them to know that I've worked hard to train for them. So I'm asking, can you get off of that couch? Off. That's how I would use that type of a cue. When I think of say a uh, leave it cue, I'm certainly not using that in the moment when my dog has say, got a piece of cat poop in her mouth. If that leave it cue is not robust, I'm setting you all up for failure and asking you to use that in a situation where, yes, it's gross, but if that dog feels that cat poop is delicious, I could have filet mignon in my pocket. And if they are not solid on that cue, no matter what I say or what I have in my pocket, that cat poop is going to be sucked into her mouth. So I think about if I have cues that can produce an alternate behavior, if they are solid cues that my dog knows, certainly can I use it? Yes. But I would be setting you up for failure if your dog does not know that cue and we're asking them to use it in those types of situations. I hope that helps. That's great. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so this is a good question. Since dominance is not a character trait, but is related to a relationship and current resources, sorry, um, how can I argue against people who say you need to show a dog who is boss in that particular relationship? <laughs> that is honestly, I mean, really great question. When I think about what that relationship looks like, I find that a lot of folks are saying, Dogs, humans. Dogs understand that they are dogs and they think of us humans as dogs as well. So that's where when I think of applying dominance theory, I get a little bit sticky because I would say the exact opposite is true. Dogs don't think that we are dogs. They definitely know that we are different. They're not looking at us and saying, oh my gosh, you are my mom or my dad. We are part of a pack together. Very different, I would say, feeling of understanding of two completely different species. So I would say if I'm even thinking about using dominance theory, if someone is talking to me about it, I certainly am not applying it to the human dog relationship because they're two completely different species. So could I think about applying it to a human human relationship? 
yeah, I could. It still makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable to use something like that as a theory. But I would say my biggest key in that factor is we aren't trying to, even as humans, we're not trying to assert dominance over our dogs who are a completely different species. We're trying to modify that behavior so that we're all successful in that relationship. I also key into a bit of what does that terminology make me feel? What does that terminology lead me to be comfortable with? If I am trying to dominate another individual, I'm certainly not, you know, getting the warm and fuzzies when I think about that. That leads me to be more comfortable with punishment, with aversives, with applying pressure. And all of that does not give me a good feeling, whether I'm talking about humans or dogs. So that's where I would say if I was having that conversation with another individual, I would stick to the facts. And really what I lay into is we got that theory from flawed studies that were done on captive animals that don't truly show that relationship. And I certainly don't want to base anything I do on flawed science if I can help it. That's great. Uh, oh, okay. Here's a question. Talk, talking about crating, I have a foster with severe separation anxiety who can be destructive when left alone, but he's crate averse. Should I work on the aversion and try to get him to the point where he'll use it instead of destroying my window frame? Or is there something else I should do? <sighs> Honestly, good question. And I would say pretty broad topic. If I touch on separation anxiety, even apart from the crating side of things, when I think of separation anxiety as a veterinarian that practices behavior, that is a true panic disorder. That's where, honestly, one of the diagnoses that I reach for medication pretty quickly to help those dogs be successful. I find that if they keep experiencing that panic over and over and over again, they're practicing that behavior, they're practicing those emotions, and it can make it harder to be successful in the future. My worry in that specific situation, the question of should I work to help them be comfortable with the crate? Should I work on a different, a, a, a different idea instead? My worry would be is it sounds like there's some pretty negative emotions associated with the crate and associated with departures. I worry if I asked you to work on crating, it would make things more difficult in the future. What I could think of is if I do have to leave, can that dog be with someone else, a friend, a neighbor, a pet sitter, a, a dog walker instead, so that they are not being left alone and we're perpetuating those feelings of separation anxiety? Other things that I can think of, I know this is a foster dog, but I think if they are showing some severe signs of anxiety, could that be a conversation to have with your organization's veterinarian? Can we get a trainer to help out with those things? Just because I would be worried about good gracious, what if we do something that makes that anxiety worse for that dog? I also think about getting, say, your organization's veterinarian involved could certainly rule out medical causes that could be potentially perpetuating that type of anxiety that we are seeing. So there's a lot of roads to go down, but I would say general answer to that question, if they are that afraid of that crate, ugh, I would be worried about trying to work through that process without some help on your side. That's a wonderful answer. Um, I think it looks like those are all the questions. Maybe okay. we'll wait a couple seconds cool. to see if anyone throws a last minute one in. But um, if not, this was so wonderful as always. Thank you so much, Dr. Rofsky. And thank you to everyone who attended. Um, we hope to see you for future webinars. And we're always here if you would like to send us an email to your dog's friend information at gmail.com with any questions at any time. Awesome. Thank, you, thank you guys for attending. Yes, lots of thank yous in the chat. Awesome.
it's a dreary Saturday. So I'm sure we, we had some folks come for sure because of that dreariness. So happy to have everyone. Oh, Deborah has informed me there's another question. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, try to see. Oh, Deborah, is it, um, I'm sorry, uh, Stacy. do wolves and dogs have a hierarchy and does dominance behavior exist in dogs? I feel like that's um, probably pretty well covered in the presentation, but I don't know if there's anything, um, I might be missing something about the question. Um, yeah, I would say if I'm thinking if I'm thinking of that question, I would say in, in the terms of say like a hierarchy. So we talked a bit about that sort of those pair of wolves that are yes in the top of the hierarchy, the breeding pair, but they're also the mom and dad of everybody else in the pack. So I would almost think of that as just say as you are respectful of your parents. That's where I would think of the term hierarchy. If I'm thinking of, say, dogs in a household, which is almost where I would take that question, think about it. Those dogs are unrelated, most likely, and there isn't necessarily a similar hierarchy to that of, say, a wolf pack. Nicole, I'm not sure if that's where I should have taken that question, but that's where I went with it. So I hope that's helpful. I think that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. And thank you all so much. I'm going to put myself on mute until everyone is gone. And hopefully we'll see you soon, Dr. Ropsky. No problem. Happy to be here. Thank you again. Mm-hmm.